So next we have Ugo Destalitz. He's a staff scientist and the deputy leader of the Indoor Environment Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And his research involves the chemistry of the built environment and urban systems. He's particularly an expert on third-hand smoke, e-cigarettes, and new technologies for energy-efficient buildings. He's done a postdoc both at Caltech and UC Davis, and has a PhD from the University of Buenos Aires. He's a mem member of the editorial board for the journal Indoor Air, and he's been elected to the Academy of Fellows at the International Society of Indoor Air and Climate. Hugo. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Barbara, and thanks everyone for uh, being here. Um, very briefly, now, uh, today I'm going to talk about just one relatively narrower uh, aspect of indoor chemistry related with tobacco smoke. In, in, if we have tobacco smoke in, in our buildings, that usually is the dominant uh, pollution source and the, the most pressing indoor uh, environmental problem, and as we have learned also an indoor chemistry problem too. So the goal here is to show how indoor chemistry builds into a larger uh, problem and also a larger research endeavor. Before I start, uh, I work, as uh, Barbara mentioned, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. We have an indoor environment group there. It's been running for several decades. It's a really very established group. Uh, our, what we do is we study the connections between indoor air quality, uh, health, productivity, and energy efficiency. We are at the Department of Energy uh, facility, so clearly energy efficiency is at the center of uh, everything we do, but in buildings we cannot really disconnect it from all the other aspects. So that's why we, our program is fairly comprehensive. Here you can see from our website some of the topics we are currently studying, and you, you, are, you, you can definitely go there and, and learn more about each of them. Today we will be mostly only talking about uh, smoking and perhaps a tiny bit of vaping at the end, because it's uh, very much in the news lately. So, uh, like a panoramic view in terms of uh, historic perspective here. We, it took about half of the 20th century for the Amer Americans, and also really around the world, to get hooked on, on smoking. Uh, as you see here, the peak is essentially in the 50s and 60s, but then we have been fairly successful in, in fighting this epidemic for the, the rest of the 20th century and, and the current, uh, the beginning of the 21st century, as we see here. So around the turn of the century, this is kind of a medical advice that we had, but also at that time, we already had a good information about the connections between smoking and health that led to the first Surgeon General report in 64, which was basically a turning point and then uh, we started focusing on, on smokers' health, like, for example, with uh, um, uh, warning labels. Already by the 80s, the focus shifted to the indoor environment and what happens with passive smoking. Uh, our group did, uh, even at that time, uh, important contributions in terms of understanding how to deal with smoking in the indoor environment. Now, if we fast forward to today, uh, I think we have been fairly successful in removing smoke from public places. Now, Smoking continues to take place mostly in homes, so our research also now is focused on what's going on in homes. About 16% uh, of adults in the U.S. still are smokers, and that essentially happens in homes and outdoors, of course. Um, so that's how third-hand smoke came into our discussion, and you know, for the last 10 years we have introduced this rather new concept of third-hand smoke by contrast with second-hand smoke, which would be now used only in terms of direct exposure to the fresh smoke as it is produced, say, as an example, if you walk into a bar where people are currently smoking. Now, in homes, many times exposures are very indirect. You know, smoke, smoking took place maybe a day ago, maybe even weeks ago. Sometimes, you know, you buy a home that where the previous owner was a smoker. So uh, this is a, the time scales are fairly different, and um, indoor surfaces play a critical role there because once the fresh smoke is emitted, most of a I mean, good part of it gets removed by ventilation, but a good, significant fraction actually stays on the surfaces and either is re-emitted at, <clears throat> at a longer time or uh, it undergoes this indoor chemistry that we're going to talk about today. 
So uh, going into the chemistry itself, this is a bit of a summary of a lot of the work we have done in our group. Uh, we studied the chemistry of nicotine in particular. Nicotine is probably the most important constituent in uh, the smoke in terms of how much is emitted. Every cigarette emits milligrams of nicotine and uh, how efficient it is as a molecule to stick to surfaces. So we studied the chemistry of that molecule with uh, for example, on the left here with a compound named uh, nitrous acid, which is also emitted with smoking and other combustion sources. And the reaction is called nitrosation. It doesn't matter, I'm not going to go into the details on the chemistry there, but what's important here is that the, the byproduct of that reaction is a group of chemicals that are globally called uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamines and uh, are some of them, some of which are carcinogenic. So I'm, in the table here we show Okay, the names, I don't give you even the, the, the full name of the chemicals, just the acronym, NNK, NNA, NNN. These are three different molecules, very similar structurally. Two of them are also present in fresh smoke, and we know they are carcinogenic. In fact, NNK is one of the most carcinogenic chemicals in smoke. The other one, NNA, actually we found on surfaces that we expose in the lab, we, th these are typically not found in the smoke. So this is a compound that is formed on our surfaces, perhaps over long periods of time, that uh, is not present in, in fresh smoke. So that's purely a third-hand smoke uh, constituent. Uh, we also could predict some levels, what to expect on surfaces, and give a very broad range of concentrations. And then, as I'll show later, some of the field work uh, kind of confirmed that uh, estimation. The other chemistry we studied is the reactions of nicotine with ozone. Ozone, as you know, is present in urban smoke. It enters our buildings. It, it's, uh, it's essentially the main driver of much of the indoor chemistry that we have studied. And what we found with nicotine is that it oxidizes nicotine to form chemicals that I will show in the next slide. And, and those chemicals many times are present in very tiny particles that we call ultrafine particles that are being produced in these reactions and re-entrained into the air. The, 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 the figure here shows a measurement with it, showing the, the size distribution of these particles. You see more than half of them are below 100 nanometers. These are particles that go deep into the lungs. Now, in terms of the composition of those particles, don't worry about the chemical structures here. The idea is to see that when you start with nicotine up here on the upper left, you oxidize it, you start seeing a bunch of molecules that look very similar but have between one and three oxygen atoms. When you put these chemical structures into a model that gives you a number, and just to simplify here things, uh, that number, we, which is called asthma hazard index, goes from zero to one, gives you an idea of how likely this molecule is to either induce or exacerbate an asthma attack. So uh, nicotine is 0.64, and, and majority of these compounds, the ones in red there, are higher. That means by oxidizing nicotine, what we are getting are compounds that tend to be more irritating. That's the one thing we learned from our laboratory studies. So by the time we uh, were doing this, this is a few years ago, other colleagues in California were also involved in other research related with this new uh, field of third hand smoke. So we got together, we created a consortium. We have been working together for now eight years and going forward for at least two more years. And I'm showing here just so you see you know, the topics that are covered goes everywhere from the chemistry to the various biological studies you know, in vitro or in animals, uh, in, in humans, um, many field measurements, and also we have an effort in terms of dissemination and outreach. Um, uh, we have been obviously uh, producing science on this, on this uh, field, so the, the publications, as you see here, are growing, this is a field that is uh, growing, not just because of the work of this consortium, but also other colleagues that are uh, uh, really contributing uh, great work, uh, particularly in recent years. The other plot on the bottom here shows a little bit how interconnected our consortium is. So we are not just uh, together, each, each of us doing our own work, we are actually learning from each other and, and, and building a, a very interdisciplinary uh, research. So the first thing we did was a roadmap. That was our first paper in 2011, uh, indicating, okay, where do we want to go in terms of uh, what, what are the gaps in chemistry, in, in biology, and in policy. We updated that on, with a second article in 2017. So if you want to read just one article on, on third-hand smoke, I would go to this 2017 
uh, review paper. I'm, I'm very happy to uh, forward you a copy if you're interested. So um, this slide actually tries to summarize in one slide the work of eight groups over eight years, so it's a bit ambitious. This is just to give you the titles of the things the consortium is doing. This is not work my group is necessarily doing, but the consortium. <clears throat> Big effort in field measurements. We go out to homes, uh, home, uh, sorry, uh, cars, hotel rooms, even a casino. So we did measurements uh, in many different environments. Uh, our colleagues in San Diego State University are actually leading that work, and very interesting results over there. One thing we found in general is that even in non-smoking environments, you do find nicotine on surfaces. So nicotine is very pervasive, and you can find it even in places that you would imagine is not there. Uh, of course, in smoking environments, it's a lot higher. Um, um, Tracers and biomarkers. We are interested in finding chemicals that one can measure in the environment, but also in our bodies, and that could, would allow us to quantify how much we are exposed to this, this. And particularly if we could differentiate these third-hand exposures from the more, uh, uh, you know, the, from the second-hand the exposure to the fresh smoke. Uh, many biological studies, for example, understanding in vitro how. Uh, these chemicals produce damage to the DNA, or in mice, mice are a good system to study chronic effects because uh, you can study ex exposure over the lifetime. And we found effects in terms of carcinogenesis uh, at various uh, organs like liver, lung, uh, skin, uh, in the immune system, and also in terms of behavior. And, and also some studies with humans actually where volunteers are breathing in uh, 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 Third-hand smoke from a special chamber we have in UCSF, uh, and finding that there is some acute effect in terms of uh, gene, ex gene expressions in the nasal epithelium. And this is a very recent study from this year. So finally, I want to say one word about policy. There is already activity in terms of third-hand smoke at the state level. Both the state of California and 14 other states have um, implemented bans on home daycare centers over the past few years. In the case of California, our work actually was used as part of the rationale for that, uh, for those measures. And uh, as a, you know, we, we are trying to expand on that by, uh, very recently, about a year ago, we, we developed this uh, resource center, which is not just a website. We have a very, uh, very nice website, actually, thirdhandsmog.org but also uh, it became very active in social media in, and with the idea of contributing to research translation. So trying to bring the findings of this consortium to the general public, to stakeholders that have really a particular um, need or, or particular situations related with third and smoke, whether it's housing, real estate, in the hospitality industry, etc. And um, we are targeting some policy directions in terms of public housing, consumer protection, and looking at loopholes uh, on, on the current uh, smoke uh, legislation. Uh, in terms of the where this is going, future direction, um, the consortium continues, and in, in our lab, we, we are yeah, we're very glad that we continue working on this, in, in a way, leveraging the, the work that our, uh, as a federal organization we do with funding from, in this case, the state, the state of California, but possibly also other, other, other federal funding agencies that are currently being um, uh, starting to fund this work, like uh, HAD and the NIH. Um, also, last word, um, this research is going really beyond this consortium, and I, I'm listing here just a few organizations, universities, that are actively working on various aspects of third hand smoke, in, including indoor chemistry, and some of these groups are supported by the Sloan Foundation, to do really wonderful work in terms of uh, understanding this complex chemistry. And final, final word on vaping. Clearly, all what I described today is about uh, cigarette smoke, but many questions arise in terms of, okay, what about vaping? Are we going to see similar chemistry if people vape instead of smoke? We can talk that, about that maybe in the questions. That would be a little too much for now. So. Uh, Thank you very much. I want to finish by uh, acknowledging a lot of people involved in all of this, in our group, first row, and the consortium, uh, in the rest of the, the slide, and of course our funding agency in the state of California, uh, tobacco-related diseases research program. So thanks very much. <laughs>